Ow now, brown cow. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Traders for a Cause podcast. I'm your host, Zach. I have a very special guest with me this evening. This is the man behind the magic of openoutcrier.com, Mr. Ryan Sellers. How's it going, buddy? Cheers, Zach. How are we doing tonight? I am doing well, and I don't have a beer. I have a soda. Let me grab my soda. That's all right. It's a, it's a Zevia. Nice. There it's we go. The, the drink of champions. There we go. So, Ryan, I've known you for a few years now. You've come to a few of our events in Las Vegas. And, and uh, one thing that I never really learned about you is kind of how you got your start doing what it is that you do. So why don't we start off by just, you know, throwing it out there. People who know you know that you primarily trade options. Is that accurate? Correct. Yep, exactly. Right. So how did you get into options? You know, how did you get into finance period? And, and what made you pick that path? Um, so I got my start in 2002. I, uh, I went to school and I got an engineering degree. So I got my degree in engineering. And I was looking at two career paths. And I remember it very vividly and one was i was going to work for like the department of transportation pouring concrete and building stuff like that and then the other one was i just applied to be a trader at the chicago board of options exchange through monster.com just threw it out there like let's see what happens wow and i was i was getting further and further it was actually oh, it was a concrete construction company i was getting further and further in the concrete interviews and one day in the middle of february I'm standing on top of a skyscraper in the city of Chicago, freezing my butt off. And they're talking about how we pour concrete and this is how we make the frames for all these buildings and stuff. And I could see the exchange from where I'm standing on top of this building. No kidding. And I had just gotten the offer from the exchange. And I was like, I'm going to go work inside over there and I'm going to try this trading thing for a, for a path. So, so I started as a floor trader. I was in the pits at the Chicago Board of Options Exchange for three years from 2002 to 2005. Okay. Uh, as a market maker. So, you know, yelling at the screens, uh, everybody in the pit, doing the hand signals, the whole thing. Unbelievable. And this was an engineering degree. With an engineering degree, right. So I was really lucky. The uh, The company I applied through a job through, it was a Dutch firm. They basically had a, a rigid sort of uh, uh, hiring process where it was, all right, everybody who wants, wants to apply for the job, show up and take a three-hour math test. That's it. All right, we'll take... Then from that, they took 10 people out of 100 or something. No kidding. Then the 10 people, then we all got into a room, and then they do some sort of like scenarios, like other sort of training stuff. And then me and another guy were the two guys that they hired from that, that whole process. So it, was, they didn't, it wasn't like you had to know anybody. You had to have an in like a lot of these other places. It was just who can, who can perform under pressure. So we did quick math and stuff like that. And uh, that's where yeah, the, rest is, the, the rest has been mind. history. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. That. I started college. Uh, I, I went to a, a small school here in Eastern Pennsylvania called Lehigh, and I started as a mechanical engineer. And after one semester and my first physics class, I decided, you know what, I'm going to switch to business. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that, my thought too, going to school was, oh, you can, do you want to go business or do you want to go, so, you know, engineering or sort some sort of that field? And the idea was you could jump one way but not the other. Like you don't see right. a whole lot of finance guys. Get an engine, you know, get in a job in engineering. This um, is true, but it it was not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I got the degree, finished it out, and couldn't be happier with how it kind of played itself. How out. it kind of played out. Over so do you do you ever years. do you do anything hobby wise that allows you to continue to engineer things outside of building Lego with with my kids or fixing stuff around the house? I have done zero with my engineering degree since the day I graduated. Um, wow as much as my parents hate that. <laughs> I was going to say, you must look back and be like, wow, that's a lot of technical knowledge that I'm not utilizing at all. <laughs> I think some, somewhere I have like a certificate that I was uh, joined. I was part of the Society of Engineers and that's the, I have this one piece of paper after college and that's it. Uh, wow. Unbelievable. Well, now you look back and you, you obviously made the right decision because you've, you've built yourself a, a, a successful business and open out crier you guys have a great subscriber base and you're doing a lot of real-time news and all kinds of fun stuff yeah thanks um i mean it's yeah it's really crazy how you kind of end up where you end up and you can't imagine ending up there any other way you know right. with the, the bruises or the bad stories or everything that goes with it it's all part of the story once you get there so 
did you have the idea early on that you were going to be a news driven trader that you were going to potentially have a, a you know offer that as a service or how did that come about all right so if from 2002 to 2005 i was a market maker on the floor so that is that's more of a position trading you're not you're trading around the, the orders that come in you're you're scalping things and you're not you're aware of the news you're more aware of earnings and events around your positions um and your stocks but it was it's not the strategy that i'm doing today at all okay um, in 2005, when I left the floor, I started working for just a small proprietary trading firm in Chicago. Um, I thought I'd be there for, you know, a few months while I found a real job, I thought, like, a, like with a big firm or something like that. Sure. And uh, I ended up there until 2018. So I was there for 13 years. Wow. When we got there in 2005, it was a bunch of ex-floor guys. This is kind of the transition from the floor to screens. You know, a lot of people, the floors were shutting down. The action wasn't really there anymore. Everything was going to the computers. So this was, we had a handful of ex-floor guys. And the strategy we were doing at the time was, it was this, we were essentially trying to emulate being market makers. We would sit on the bid and the ask of these really deep markets and just kind of scalp inside these positions. Sure. There were certain advantages we had as you trade as a customer, you get the fill before every market maker. That's just kind of the market rules. Um, and it was, it's, it, you know, picking up pennies in front of the steamroller kind of thing where you're sure. just kind of making a little, making a little, making a little, grinding it out, but you'd get run over once or twice. And it's, you know, it takes, it takes away a week, of, a week of grind. So we were really grinding it out. And uh, in 2008, when everything kind of went to, went to hell, in the financial markets, we had a little bit of a breakdown and we just, it was the worst year I've ever had. We got run over like crazy. And in a good way, that's when I started to have the epiphany of, well, I don't want to be the guy sitting on the offers getting run over. I want to be the guy going and finding the, the trade and, and, and doing the running over, you know? Sure. I don't want to be taking the hit. I want to be given the hit. Of course. So from then on, from 2008, that's when we decided as a group, we're like, let's, we got to change it up. And so we switched our entire strategy from market makers to market takers. And we went from then on to try to grow and build the strategy. And we found, you know, a lot of different ways to, to find an edge in taking markets and being aggressive about it. And in doing so, I mean, it's, it suits my mindset. It suits my mentality. Um, it, it makes me interested in the markets every day to come in and find that next thing. So it's been a really good fit. And from there, I've just tried to grow it as much as I can, uh, tweaking, tweaking the strategy, adding to it, taking away from it and messing around with that. But very simply, even to this day, the two things and the, th the ways that I trade, it's news and volume. I'm looking for volume that's going to have news or I'm looking for the news and then creating the volume. Nice. So like having having the news service was born from your early strategy of kind of like changing gears and going into that type of mindset. Exactly. Exactly. Um, if we started in, if we started trying to tweak the strategy of being market takers and being more aggressive in 2008, I want to say that in 2012 ish, 2011, 2012 is when I, we joined Twitter and just kind of started to, partake in the conversation on Twitter, um, sharing news and information. We kind of saw that we were seeing things faster than people were putting it out there. We were seeing things that were wrong or misinformation. We were able to correct it out there. So it was a, in, in addition to seeing this online and trying to just help out, it kind of bore itself out a little bit naturally from there. That's awesome. So Twitter is your primary mode of, of, putting information out there and talking about news or would you say that it's balanced between that and your platform or do you kind of like pick and choose from your platform? So we started putting everything on Twitter before we decided to do our own service. Um, and after we started our service, we never wanted to come, we never wanted to go away from Twitter. It's, it's such a great resource for traders just from information and, and helpfulness and community. I mean, we really love it. So we made the decision that we were always going to present our pre-market information on Twitter, no matter what. And then once the day starts, that will, that's when we do all our, our live posts in the room. So if you're looking for breaking news to act on when the market's open, that all of that we put on our own platform. Got it. 
but we always do the pre-market stuff just as a way to give back and to keep everyone involved and to show that we're still, Hey, we're still out here. That's awesome. So in, in this market environment, at least, I mean, I've, I've been away from the trade desk for a few years now, but I, I always remember thinking that with breaking news, sometimes it's really hard to find an edge, especially um, in the age of, of algorithms and mm -hmm. you know, you're never going to react as quickly as a computer. Yep. Do you, do you kind of hope that, the, the algos make mistakes and you can kind of see through it. And or, I mean, you can't obviously race a computer, right? So right. How do you, where, where's the edge there? Um, so the edge is, so there's there's one thing that we'll, we're never gonna be able to compete with. And that is just like you said, an algo that, that sees a headline on Bloomberg. There, if it's a, if they announce takeover on Bloomberg, you're gonna see the, st the, the spike. It's gonna be almost an insta halt situation. Like you said, there's nothing we can do with that. And that's that's fine. I'm not trying to compete with that, but there's so many other great sources of information. Um, knowing alternative sites, knowing where news comes from a specific sector, there's industry websites that we can follow to where things kind of work their way out. You can follow uh, tech, you know, tech focused websites. You can find the right people. There's a crawler that you find the people, those writers that write for those sites. You find them on Twitter, you follow them on Twitter. They release a lot of things that way. Um, so kind of just def redefining and kind of continually searching for that edge with the sources of information that are out there. Um, yeah, there's, there's the, the Bloomberg is the Bloomberg. We can't, we're not going to beat that. That's, that's fine. And that's okay, but we watch it. So we're aware of it. Sure. So the other thing we can do too, is we can try to see the people that are front running Bloomberg. So we'll see trades in the market. If somebody buys something crazy that doesn't make sense in the options market, something crazy. They bought 10,000 calls. This thing trades. 300 contracts a day, you know, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. Sure. And you'd be amazed how often that those guys just happen to get, you know, lucky with their, <laughs> uh, with their trade. So. so would that be, that would be actionable for you? Like if you read the tape and you saw that you would, you would take action and take a position. Yeah. If it's the right, the right strike, the right price, the right time of day. Sure. If I can get into the, as about the same price as I saw the trade go off, uh, I'll absolutely piggyback that trade. Nice. Nice. Um, and it's been, like you said, with how the markets are now, there's so much interest in options. It's just been crazy. You keep hearing gamma squeeze, gamma squeeze, and all this other stuff that it's great for us. I mean, there's just more eyes is more volume. It's just more opportunity. Yeah, I was uh, I was talking to somebody recently about this. And, you know, the old adage is, you know, you, you buy the rumor and sell the news. And I, I swear, I think I heard it on CNBC the other day. Somebody said, now you buy the rumor and you buy the news. <laughs> Do you think yeah. there's any truth to that right now in this market? This In this market right now, for a little while, it has been like that. Um, and I I think it was even Kramer and Faber that were talking about it. They are saying, yeah, everything. And I would say from about December to through to February this year, the last two to three months, it's been a market where it feels like everything works. You could whisper a name. You could put in the hints of, a, of news and up until a week or two ago when things started to get a little bit a little bit more touch and go anything that was whispered or thought about or talked about it it, it seemed like it almost all worked a little bit of options volume worked a little bit of everything um i don't think that's going to last forever <laughs> of course not by any means it never does um but it has it's been that way for a little bit and it's surprising but it just it tells you what what kind of market we're in and being aware of that uh, so you can take advantage of it when it's there. Of course. So as is the case with the equities market, obviously there's a lot of new traders. You're saying there's a lot new traders in the in the options market as well? Yeah, I definitely believe that. The volume, think, the volume has just been crazy. Do you think that they're primarily, you know, buying calls and puts or are they actually selling them as well? I believe that they're primarily buying. So going long options, which is also primarily how I trade. And okay. this is just from a straight risk standpoint, whatever I pay for an option, that's the most I can lose. So right. that's a way to manage risk just on its own face. If I pay 50 cents for an option, I can only lose 50 cents. It's and a good way of looking at it. If I short an option, I could lose God knows how much. I can't even imagine <laughs> what some of these people were looking at at GameStop. If you shorted this call, like you short a hundred call on something that came from 10 bucks, sure, it should never ever get there. Yeah, but it did, and that's it. <laughs> You're done. You're blown out You're forever. So yeah, yeah. It's just it, the risk reward just isn't there. Crazy. So, so you primarily are uh, a long side trader, generally. 
Yes. Yes. Do you ever make exceptions to that? Um, I trade spreads. Okay. Uh, so this is a situation where some options knowledge can take advantage of this, of what's going on out there. Sure. Everybody that trades stuff now, they're trading the, the front week, the front month. They're trading the first thing that they see. If you talk about unusual options volume and something, everybody goes and gets laser focused on that one strike. Sure. They don't realize that all these things are connected and there's a way that they should move. So if you're quick and pay attention, then a lot of times these things get out of whack. So that creates an opportunity with a little bit of less risk too. Got it. I can sell the one that everybody's looking at and buy something that's further out, longer dated, that's safer. It's not going to move as fast. And then just wait for the spread just to kind of measure out where I think it should go. Got it. Got it. So how uh, how did you make it out in 2020? Was it, I mean, a lot of people say it's a record year. Did you join that group? Yeah, it was my best year ever. Awesome. It was. In 2021, on, on path for the same? It's on path for my best year ever. <laughs> it's awesome. So it's just unbelievable, isn't it? It's, like it is crazy. I'm every day I come in and keep trading and also in the back of my head, I'm like, it's going to end, it's going to end, it's yeah. going to end. But you know, it always does eventually, but right. you know, you're, you're, you're a veteran. You've been around long enough that you're going to be fine. Uh, as, as are most of the guys that I know, but, uh, I, I wish I could say the same for the, the herd that came in in 2020. Right. They're, uh, they're going to be up for a rude awakening you know, when, when things change. It's interesting though, because it's, I'm an old trader now. I've been trading for almost 20 years. And so I need to reprogram myself to say, not this shouldn't happen, but this is happening. Right. The trade, what is happening, not what I think should happen or like, this is crazy or this doesn't make any sense. I got to cut that part of my brain out and just trade what's happening. It's really Be funny that you say it. that because Greg in, in talking with me last week, uh, which was on our last podcast, he had mentioned that he feels that having experience in this market is a liability. Yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> which completely is, agree. Which is just crazy to think about. You know, like you guys right. have been through, you know, all kinds of market, crazy market moves and everything. And it's just. I mean, one one day it won't be. But for now, it's it's absolutely. I, I literally say trade dumber. I need to <laughs> trade dumber and stop thinking and just trade it like just. Stop just go in there and trade it. Don't, that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean get rid of your risk controls. It doesn't mean um, just let everything go forever. But as far as taking a trade and seeing what happens for now in this market, it's worth it. Nice. Maybe as of this week, it, we're starting to see that it's shifting a little bit, but time will tell if, if it's going to make a total shift or if it's just another bump in the road on the way to God knows where. So the moon, as they say. <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> So have you ever have you ever played around with any other instruments or is, are you just straight up options and from the beginning? Do you ever touch I, anything else? I'm almost exclusively options. Um, I will. I have started to trade stock in the the pre and post markets. I'm um, nice. in pretty early doing my market prep. Uh, so if I see things and I can't trade options on it, I'll take stock positions. Um, there's some of these situations with these names, some of the Reddit names where things have gotten so insane. I can't trade these options. I can't. They're so ungodly expensive. I can do spreads yeah. and I can do stuff like that. But just to trade them directionally, it's insane. Um, you'll see a lot of a lot of guys complain because GameStop's trading three hundred dollars. They'll buy a hundred put. GameStop goes down to one hundred and fifty, and they lose money, and they don't understand why. <laughs> they don't understand how volatility works. They don't understand that everything got so insane that as it came back down, even though the stock went down fifty percent their puts, the volatility went down 85%. Like right, it, right. there's a relationship there that's, that doesn't click with a lot of people. Um, right. So recognizing even in the craziness, what not to trade and how not, how to avoid some of the stuff. Uh, that's, that's an asset. Nice. I was going to ask you if you got involved with GME at all. Did you trade it? Not nothing big. Not, <laughs> like by, that's not my game. That's not what I do. I was thoroughly engaged with the story. I loved watching it. I love following it. Um, a couple of things is most of the moves were overnight and I'm a day trader. Primarily I go home flat almost every night or very near to flat. So for me to, uh, to have a position on overnight like that, to catch the, the doubling that happened overnight, it's just, that's not going to happen. Right. Right. That's actually going to be my next question. I wanted to ask you if you, if you have any swing positions, do you, I mean, options and equities, you'll, you're flat 
end of every day cash yeah almost almost exclusively um I deal mostly in trading when I'm trading the new stuff. I like to trade in the front month in the shortest term that gets the most swing that that'll move the most on news, which is what I like to trade. So, but if I'm holding it overnight and it doesn't work, that means it's going to work against me the most overnight. It's going to have the greatest effect with time decay and things like that. Got it. So in the stuff that I like to trade, it's uh, good news, bad news. It's bad to swing that type of stuff. I, if I was going to swing positions, I'd swing longer term. Or I'll swing spreads because that, to me, that's that's really low risk stuff. Have you ever thought about using equities to, to hedge a position in options or, or vice versa? Yeah, there's there's definitely some of that. Uh, I just I've never gotten to the the risk reward parameters that seem worth it to me. Right. And, and also, I don't I'm so used to not coming in with positions now. Right. I love the I like the feeling of coming in fresh. I like the clean slate. I don't have any baggage. I'm not, I'm not like upset that a position didn't work out for me or it's, it's not happening like I liked. So every morning I come in and I'm, I'm ready to go. My, my head is clear and I can kind of attack each day on its own merits. Interesting. It's just kind of what works for me over the years I found. Interesting. Very cool. So what, what's your, t <laughs> I'm asking this of everybody that I, that I talk to, what's your take on wall street bets? What's the deal with Reddit? What, like, um, as, as it's amazing. I mean, it really is amazing as a, as a community and as a group, I've gone in there and I, I think I first went in there the spring of last year. So kind of around pandemic when everything was going a little bit crazy, there started to be some talk about things going on in there. Um, so I checked it out and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I couldn't, I couldn't parse the language. I couldn't figure it out. Like I just couldn't get it. It just, it just, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't get it. I, and I try, I looked at it and I was like, ah, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's this, it's this crazy thing, you know, whatever. That's fine. It's over there. And it's, but what happened with GameStop was just, I mean, it's truly amazing. It was the perfect situation for a bunch of long retails to find this opportunity of this incredibly over leveraged short company. And in, it was the right stock, the right name for these, like, GameStop for people on Reddit. It just, it makes sense logically that there's some, <laughs> there's an overlap there, you know? Sure. I get it. Now that all this has happened and it's been so nuts and crazy, I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And there's always been, it seems like every day or two now there's the next GameStop. Every, there's another name that they pick that they like for a day or two. It was Palantir, it was uh, Blackberry, they did Nokia, AMC is probably the second one. If you go I'd go GME, then AMC is probably number two. BlackBerry is pretty close in there. Mm -hmm. Then a bunch of these guys had a, had a run like, it was, oh, who's everybody short? Express, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, Nokia had a run. They mentioned that SKT Tanger outlet was one for a while that they ran back today. Rocket Mortgage got another name, another mention this week. So they're like, sure. they're jumping from one thing to the next. And it's interesting and it's fun to trade, but it just doesn't seem like the staying power is there long term yet. The only one that has been able to stick it out is GameStop still over hundred. I mean, that's every time they go away and find another name, they keep coming back to GameStop. Um, <laughs> keep coming back to whatever, for whatever, for whatever that's worth. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and then you got that, their, their, uh, their investor, Ryan Cohen tweeting pictures of an ice cream cone, sending the stock up 50%. And what do you do today? He did a picture of, a picture of pets.com and a, a frowny face or something. And it's another 30% in the stock. It's nuts. You know, Greg said last week that he compared the influence that they're having on these stocks uh, to the message boards in the late nineties, the Yahoo message yeah. boards. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely some similarities. Um, I'm concerned that it will lead to regulation that they will, it'll lead to either a financial transaction tax or some sort of, curbs put in place by the government which i obviously i think would be bad for everybody a new pattern day trader rule something something that's just completely hard to understand and doesn't really make sense and there's a million new things you got to figure out that'll probably kill trading for a little bit until everybody figures out what to do next and then everyone will evolve but yeah i could see congress coming in with a heavy hand and kind of messing things up a little bit which i'm concerned about um, I have been looking at some things since I can't make sense of it as I look at Reddit 
personally, like the, the posts, I can't read through them. I can't understand what makes sense or what's important each day and what isn't. Right. I do find some people that are making some really interesting, uh, it's sort of data mining. It's more just they're, they're talking about how many mentions there are. They're doing how many posts have been made on a certain name and seeing that. And so people have just sent me some really cool graphics and they're saying, these are the most talked about names and graphics form for the last 24 hours. And you can see a name kind of skyrocket out of nowhere. And that, that shows interest that that seems more important and relevant to me. Just the overall kind of hive mind interest versus one person saying one thing on there that all of a sudden matters or doesn't. I want, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious as to the guys or whoever's behind that, like, you know, what, what their trading is like, like, are they, are they trading on Robin hood? Like, <laughs> yeah. Are they, are they like the most unsophisticated trader? Like they just decided like, Hey, let's go out after the American public and teach them a thing or two about how the stock market works. It almost yeah. seems like it's a. And how many, how many, how many, how many hedge funds are in there? How many other shops are in there trying to sway the conversation? It just seems, it just seems messy. Yeah. Really is the way I describe it. No doubt. So what's working for you? What, what what primarily are you trading now that seems to be really working? So sticking to sticking to the news and uh, and options flow for me, something that I've been I've done. I actually I had my best trade ever just last week, and it was on the news that the U.S. Postal Service contract for their new trucks was going to go to Oshkosh, which meant that it wasn't going to go to this company workhorse, which makes electric delivery trucks. Right. And that was kind of the whole long thesis on workhorse was them getting this contract. It was a big part of their valuation. Everybody thought it was, they were going to get it. And it, they might, there's some things that might happen where they might, or they might not. But so this was a trade and I don't, I don't put trades on before news, but what I like to do is I like to game plan for a situation that might happen. Right. And this was a situation that I had game plan for. This was a, a binary event. If they got it, um, I'm going to buy as many calls as I can as fast as I can. And if they didn't, I'm buying as many puts as I can as fast as I can. And it's, it's just that simple. But n having that in my head that this news was going to happen, and it was lucky in some levels that it came out as an Oshkosh headline and not a workhorse headline. Sure. Because that gives you just a little bit more time to make the correlation. Sure. And to get in there and get that position on for, for a decent size. So your previous best trade that we heard a, a full story about it, yeah. well, I think it was Traders for a Cause 19. You told the story about your, what, what was the stock? I don't even know. That was, that was Alibaba. That's right. Alibaba on the White House. No, it was Alibaba. Um, they were going to delist the uh, White House threatening to delist Chinese stocks. So this, this has dethroned the Alibaba it trade. It has. Yep. Was it dethroned before this one? No, Was it? it wasn't. It wasn't. So <laughs> all of uh, all of 2020, I didn't eclipse that trade from 2019. Wow. I never had a better trade. I've just kind of consistently better days more often and way less red days. I've just been very consistent at not not having that big that big monster blow up or anything like that, um, which has been great for my stress levels. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So the, this, uh, this new record breaking trade for you, how long were you in? I was in the trade. It probably ended up being over the course of about an hour, but this was a, this was an odd situation. So they, they were getting halted to the downside because they're, they're hitting circuit breakers. So they're hitting a circuit breaker, doing a 10 minute halt circuit breaker, 10 minute halt. Sure. And for the first time in a long time that the circuit breakers helped me. And rarely that's that, that usually doesn't happen. It always <laughs> seems like you get, time to regroup. <laughs> it always seems like you get screwed over on the skirt breaker. It's, it, it just kills the momentum of the trade. They come out and they say something different or whatever. It just all, it never seems to work. And every time they would halt it, I just cancel my order and put it lower and they'd gap it lower. And I'd say, all right, I'm canceling it. I'm putting it lower. And I just kept doing it. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not, we're going to play this game all day. That's I'm just, awesome. I'm just going to keep doing it. That and so, so cool. I, I did that until it bounced. And then I covered when it bounced and it was, Glorious. Yeah, it, was, it was great. It was very, then you, very. Then you felt like you had to do a couple laps around your house. If, if I mean, it, it's it's crazy because I don't get the the euphoria like I used to. It's almost it's like relief. It's like yes, like the thing happened like I wanted it to happen, and it and it feels great. Don't get me wrong, but it's not. It's not like let's go get bottles at the club anymore. It's <laughs> <laughs> let's get that front table now. 
Right. Yeah. It's uh. It's oh yeah. We're getting uh. We're getting a TV in the minivan or something. something well, like. you know what they say. Like we we've had guys talk about this at Traders for a Cause all the time. You know, like act like you've been there. You right. know, like once you're once you do it professionally, you can't get super high at at a win. Just mm -hmm. like you can't get super depressed at a loss. Yeah. Just this week on Monday, I had my worst day in a long time. Maybe a year or two. Close to worst ever. I don't know. I. I've blocked out whatever that number was, but <laughs> the feeling of that loss was easily 10 times worse than the feeling of the game. So true. I, I, I just heard this on a podcast recently. They were talking about this concept that no matter what, it could be a smaller loss. It always hurts more to lose always than, it, hurts than, more. than, than it feels good to win. Yeah. And it's not even, it's an order of magnitude. It's not even close. Um, and I would like, let's if my, if my win was five X, my loss was one X, but it felt 10 times worse than the gain still. Like it's, it, that's just how, how I'm wired. It's just like, just, just frustration and anger. And yeah, that's, that's how it's always going to be. I can't see that ever changing. What, so what do you see recently? Obviously, that you're, if you had a record trade last week, then that, that kind of answers the question. But um, from a news perspective, like what sector of news is really active right now? Like what, what's moving? What's moving stuff? It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to pick one right at this second, I would say. Okay. Um, it went from EVs and EV related. You could talk about EVs or batteries or anything in that space, and they were super hot, and that was – that would send his stocks flying. Mm -hmm. um, it shifted a bit into uh, crypto, which crypto has kind of been a thing and the crypto related stocks. And then there, uh, during that same sort of period of time, there was all the SPACs. So you got all these SPACs out there and then it was the rumored targets and who they're going to be going after. And that was fun for a while, but now it almost seems like they're, they're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel for these, <laughs> these SPAC names. I have, I haven't even recognized the companies that these guys are, are trying to bring public now. Wow. So in the last week, uh, especially with the market pulling back some, there's a little bit of fear. There's not that the full euphoria isn't there anymore. So sure. I think we're kind of taking a pause right at the second. Okay. And I can't see one that's leading. We even had a, we even had a, the, the pot rally again. There was one of those in the last three months where Tilray went from 10 to 50 and back down to 20 or something like that. Everyone can use a good pot rally every now and again. Everyone can use a good pot rally. Um, you know, so it's been super fun. And you have all these sectors get hot in a three month span and kind of go bonkers a little bit. Uh, it's yeah. That's why things have been so good for the last few months. and so crazy, but I, I think, I think people are going to be a little bit cautious just maybe till we see what's going to happen with stimulus and what the, everyone's looking at the, what Powell's doing and all that stuff now. So there's kind of some, some shifting perspectives a little bit right now. Sure. Makes sense. So I understand that you recently moved. Is that true? I am in the process of moving. I haven't moved yet. Oh, you haven't moved yet. I haven't oh, I moved yet. No. So I'm still in, uh, I'm still in Chicago here. I thought this was like a newly decorated room in your, Oh no, no. This house. is our, this is our, my, our basement basically. <laughs> no kidding. Um, so where are you moving to? Uh, we were moving to Austin, Texas. Oh, I'm jealous. I'm excited. You know, I hear so many great things about Austin. Everybody that lives there seems to absolutely love it, except when their pipes freeze and they lose power for a week and a half. But yeah, that was that was an interesting time. But uh... <laughs> I guess it came, I mean, as far as weather is concerned, let's not really compare it to Chicago. I I live in the Northeast, north of Philadelphia, and I will say that this winter is making me more and more want to. We had something like uh, 10 days in a row of snow, of measurable snowfall while that thing was going on in Texas. So yeah, my, my, my shovel hand was strong for a good week and a half. No doubt. No, we got so much snow early, earlier in the season. We had like a, we had like a 30 incher mm -hmm. and then that was just, that was just piled on after that. And, you know, we it felt like it was snowing every week. It's yeah. very unusual. Last year we had nothing like, Next to nothing. I don't even think I used the snowblower last year. Our season last year was bookended with snow on Halloween and snow in like April or something. It was weird and nothing in the middle. Right. It was so well, strange. You're, you're, you're going the right direction going to Austin. 
So what made you pick Austin? Is just like, hey, let's pick a city that we think we'd like or um we my wife and I went there a while ago and liked it, you know, maybe 10 years ago, a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um I have a good friend who moved there 2 years ago and has been talking it up quite a bit and then we went to visit with the kids in January for a week. Um just kind of rented a house, did a work like a working vacation, work in the morning and then kind of do stuff in the afternoon mm-hmm. and it was it was just kind of mind you know boggling how much fun it was to be able to go and do all this stuff right after work or so close to to work cuz work you know it literally is one of those stories where work from home has changed everything for me um even though I'm self employed I was still going to an office to trade right up until the pandemic so we're coming up on a year of doing it at home it's gone great uh i and i can't see ever going back to an office but at the same time, at the end of the day, like I got to get out of my house. I got to go do something. <laughs> sure. Otherwise, I feel like I'm just a prisoner in here and I, sure. I got to go. And I, I just don't feel like there's a lot I can do right now with sure. the, the cold and the weather. And So why not go to a place where it's nice all the, all, all the time? Yeah. And there's a ton of stuff to do outside where we can run around and go hiking and all kinds of stuff. We've talked about moving, you know, just casually talking about moving somewhere warmer mm-hmm. and – uh I, you know, I have a lot of connections in the San Diego area and California is obviously very, very expensive. And Mm -hmm. when visiting a friend out there, um, I remember he uh, made a comment that really resonated with me because, you know, obviously you don't get much property. You don't get a, you don't get a big house in California unless you're, you know, super rich. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, how do you, I mean, don't you feel claustrophobic like in like small house? And he's like, well, when it's nice all the time, you never feel like you're cooped in a house. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, it's a really good point. Like, this time of year, you know where you live, certainly where I live. You know, it's just not fun to go outside. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go out to ski, but hey, if you live in California, you can go to Great Bear, right? You can, yeah, take take a short trip to go skiing. Yeah, I don't mind if it's snowing if I can go and do something with it. But otherwise, <laughs> all you got to do is shovel and then look at it. It's- <laughs> Seems like a waste. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and it makes your car dirty and it's, yeah. There's not very many redeeming things about it, to be honest. Kids yep. like to play in it, but they played in it this year like two times. And then they were like, okay, we're over this. And they haven't gone out since. So it's, mm-hmm. <laughs> what's the point? So Ryan, a question that I like to ask um, a lot of my guests, I, 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 at least I try to, is... The guys that I've had on so far are very successful traders. They have, you know, prolific careers doing this. They have services. Um, They definitely don't have to keep trading to pay their bills. So my question for you is, at the end of the day, what is it that gets you up in the morning? What is it that keeps you coming back to the trade desk? Why do you do what you do? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that when it started for me was not knowing, not having the financial background and being, having an engineering background, it almost felt like a math problem. Like I wanted to come in and try to solve the market or solve my little corner of the market each day. And what was the, the things I could put together to do that? And it's a crazy complex problem. And each day it's, it's different. There's a different problem to solve. There's a different questions to be asked and answered. Um, and so my approach was always, you know, how could I have put this day together to solve the problem for myself? Um, and that's how I review my, when I review my trades, that's what I look at. I say, all right, what did I do good? How did I tackle that problem good? How did I fail? Or what could I do better? And every day when I look back on there's, you can always do better. So there's always the motivation to to be better and to do better. And so there's, I can't ever see eclipsing that with the market. It's, it's just too grand. It's too big. So that's, it's a really cool problem. It's really neat and it's always changing. And it's, I just find it so crazy interesting. It's almost like, it's almost like an unsolvable problem. So it is, you know, it is a never ending quest, right? Wow. That's a, that's a cool journey. So, so, so the, you just actually love the idea of solving this market issue, market problem. And that's what kind of like keeps you going. That's what keeps gas in the tank for you. Sure. 
Sure. So these are the variables I got today. Here's how I came up with it. If I shifted this to this side and did this another way, and when you look back on it, you're always like, oh, well, there's a better, there was a better, more elegant solution that I didn't see. Let's try it tomorrow. My friend, so that is time. spoken in the words of a true engineer. <laughs> and, I, and, and I went to an, a primarily engineering school, and and I know that is exactly how their brains work. So I'm a nerd. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, uh, how are you feeling? Do you feel like uh, you're carrying momentum and it's going to continue into the, into the year? And like, are you afraid that setups are going to disappear or dry up? Or are you kind of confident? Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, there's, there's still tons of opportunity. There's still tons of eyes on the market. I, there's going to be a moment where people are going to get hurt and it's going to, it's a it's, reckoning. There's going to be a reckoning, and there will, be, and I, and that might not be for literally another year, sure. or, or more. It could take forever. There's sure. so many things. Everyone wants to compare this time to the dot com in '99, and I don't think the the market broke until mid like early 2000. Right. So there's a full year of mania to trade before it really fell apart. So, I mean, em, embrace the mania, trade it, and you know, you'll probably lose some money one day, but just don't lose it all on the way, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> live to fight another day, live to fight another day. Um, those, are good, those are, those are words to live by. What is it? There's, there's better discretion and valor. So I don't know the quote. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we tried. Uh, well, like, thanks for being with me. And, you know, thank you for uh, being a longtime supporter of Traders for a Cause and participating in all of our events. And maybe, maybe just maybe, I, I think it's kind of, a very small percentage chance that we'll go back to Vegas this year. Yeah. Kind of trying to weigh it out for yeah. a couple months and <laughs> figure out whether, um, you know, we're going to have some ridiculous hotel liability for rooms and stuff. It's just right. a, it's, it's a big gamble. You know, if you don't know what it's going to be like then, or who's going to be willing to travel, it's, it's kind of a tough decision to make at this juncture, but we're definitely going to continue with our virtual events, uh, of which I, I hope to, uh, have you a part of if you're willing yeah for sure well you guys do a great job it's a great organization oh well thanks so much man thank you again and uh i guess i'll sign off uh for this week and uh, say trade profit make a difference and we'll see you next week guys take All care right. see you so uh so i What's good I'm man kinda, yeah, I'm kind of a dumb dumb when it comes to options. Okay. I mean, like I, uh, you're like okay. No, no, no. I know what I'm I'm, in for. I'm getting. We're getting. uh, We're we're getting started. We we're we're feeling out what we got to cover and how we got to how we got to talk about it. That's that's. So what exactly is a call?